Good evening and welcome to the weekly Cavan GA broadcast on Player Pathways brought to you by Cavan GA. I'm Damien Donoghue and this week's programme continues the theme of looking at the options for players and tonight we're focusing on the training and education and employment opportunities available in the local area. Before I introduce my guests for this evening's programme, I um, just want to extend my congratulations to Raymond Galligan, Park Faulkner and Thomas Galligan on their PWC All-Star Award, which was announced yesterday. I know it's brought a great amount of uh, pride and uh, smiles to the Cavan people listening to that all over the news yesterday. Some people who have, have brought smiles and pride in the past, I'm delighted to uh, introduce our first guest tonight, which is a former Cavan ladies star, Ashley Doonan. Um, we also have Enda O'Reilly, who's from the Cavan Institute, and Jack Trainer, who's a member of the Cavan Under 20s panel and who's employed as an apprentice accountant here in Cavan with KBG. Um, Ashley, I suppose just very briefly, your your football career you recently hung up your boots although it, it, it seems probably a few months back now but the, the news only broke a few weeks ago how's retirement suiting you great and i know pre-season runs uh, it's the longest pre-season ever i think at the moment so uh no i'm enjoying it like i was like i said i talked to you before and i was very content with my decision having given a long time to the inside at county level so I'm looking forward to um, giving a bit of time back to my club and, and enjoying putting on the, the green gold temple court Yeah we, we had Pamela McCabe on Nee Crow and she was talking about the, the long career she had how many years exactly just tell the viewers how many years you played for Cavan God, I think it was 19 now in fairness I did have a, I was lucky I did have a break or two with travelling um, took two like two separate years out to travel which was a great opportunity as well but yeah, so when I started, like I was on the senior inter-county ladies team when I was uh, 14 going on 15, which thankfully isn't, uh, you don't see it happening um, at the moment. Thank God. It, you had to grow up quick though, playing county senior football at 14. I suppose it, 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 it as we said to Pamela as well, it gave you a huge advantage when you were going forward in life. Definitely, like be surrounded by older players, you did have to grow up quick and you had to, um, learn and you got those experiences and skills that probably st stood by me as I was going through secondary school, college and even those skills that you know you hear a lot about in competencies and soft skills that employers are looking for like I would have been working on them from a young age you know your time management um, trying to uh, teamwork collaboration like all of those things like at the time obviously I was just playing football I didn't know any different but I was so it was really important to something like sport and Gaelic games, especially at local level, can um, help you uh, further on in life, like those life skills and social skills. Mm, I suppose taking it on to your, your career, you're, you're currently working with Cavan Sports Partnership. You're the Community Sports Development Officer. But tell us a bit about your career pathway and you know what, what you studied through college. Yeah, so I, I went the CEA route, so I went direct enough, I went to UCD um, and I studied a Bachelor of Science of Sports Management. So I was lucky enough, I suppose I kind of stayed in the sports sector. I did three years in UCD and then I came home. I was actually working at home, so I wasn't really sure. I was only 20 when I was graduating or going on 20, so I was very young coming out of college. Like a lot of people are only going to college at that age group. And you really know, set in your mind what you want to do. Like I knew I was passionate about sport and sports development um, really stood out for me in college and trying to develop that side of things. Um, so I, I came home, I, I worked actually, I was lucky to get a job in the Sleeve Russell, um, who have been very good to people locally. Um, so I worked in the country club there. So that gave me good insight into, you know, fitness, um, gym, how operations work and that. And then from there, I worked, um, I got a job in coaching and games development in Fermanagh. So I spent about six years there and really enjoyed that. I uh, got huge experience from, from working in schools, clubs, uh, became a tutor with Sport Ireland. Um, so I was able to deliver courses to coaches, uh, to referees and teachers and uh, to upskill. And, and then through that, I kind of seen, OK, I actually really like that side of things, being able to um, you know, teach and coach. And I suppose probably in hindsight, if I had opportunities, I probably would have went maybe the teaching route. But just at the time, I, I just didn't think that was for me. Um, when I was in secondary school, I didn't have that experience. And um, so then from 
uh, working in, in Fermanagh, I, I went traveling for a year. And then after that, I suppose it was a bit of a wake up call. I had a bit of an easy route and I just went into different jobs. So I didn't have uh, work. I, I went back part time to the Russell, who were very good to me. And I, I worked a little bit part time myself doing exercise classes in the evening. So um, I had been applying for jobs and that really kind of opened up my eyes to, I suppose, having your degree, but also having those skills and competencies behind you to try and go into other uh, areas. So I was very much sports orientated. And, you know, if you want to try and go into a different area of work. Um, originally, I thought, God, it was very hard, but through working with people, I had already a huge bank of skills and, and expertise that I didn't personally think I had, but through uh, working maybe with a coach and a development uh, coach uh, for career, I was able to draw experience from, you know, personal life, but also sporting life and, and those competencies I talked about, like teamwork, communication skills, time management skills. Um, they're all things that employers are looking for. And, and nearly every interview you go now um, or any job application you're looking at, it is competency based and, and you're able to you'd be able to reflect and, and draw from your experiences. So I, I went, I got for, I got work in uh, Crow Park, which was the dream. And um, so ladies football. So I was delighted with that because I was able to combine both I suppose, the sporting and development background, but also give back to a sport that had given me so much. So I, I moved to Dublin and um, it's probably more a personal decision as well. And um, because my, well, at the time, Donald, my fiance at the time, uh, we'd gotten engaged. So somebody had to give, I think, between he was working in Dublin. Uh, he was an aircraft technician. So there was no run arrays around uh, Bombay or Ballyconnell, unfortunately. So uh, I, I took the plunge and I went to Dublin and I say very lucky to be working in Crow Park and getting uh, loads of experience there throughout the country at that high end level. Um, and then I was there for three, three, four years. And I suppose we kind of got to a stage in our life where we were like, do we want to be in Dublin a long time? And I know there's a lot of people now uh, probably graduated, you know, city life and Dublin life is great for a short time. Um, and then you probably have to make a decision. Is this where I want to spend the rest of my years or do I want to make a move home? And, and for both of us who are running the roads home every weekend, anyway, for club and county football, we, we decided we'd, we'd try and make the move home. And, and I was very fortunate to get get a job in the Calvin Sports Partnership and it was good timing. Um, so I'm very lucky to be able to continue that line of work um, and something that I'm passionate about as well. Tell us a little bit about the role um, of Community Sports Development Officer. Yeah, so it, it's probably not that as advertised. It's it's not your traditional, you know, you're teaching your finance, your marketing, your business background. Um, it's so basically the Cavan Sports Partnership, our, our goal is to increase participation. So we're trying to uh, decrease that uh, physical activity gradient within the population of Cavan. So we focus a lot on minority groups. So, you know, your teenagers, uh, older adults, disability, disadvantaged communities. And we're trying to increase participation. So that could be through physical activity programs. It could be through sport. It could be trying to improve infrastructure within the county um, from resources or equipment or trying to work with the county council to, um, you know, get your cycle lanes in and improvements in parks. Um, and like, so it it's a, it, what I really enjoy, but it, it's a mixture of, thing, of things and you're not just one sport. So, you know, it doesn't matter if you're, you know, 60 year old lady um, that's never been involved in sport. Maybe there's it's a walking or a cycling program or it's a Pilates or yoga. So there is exercise and physical activity for everybody. You just probably haven't found the right one. And, and that's where we are trying to get those hard to reach groups and um, support them in increasing their physical activity. It's like a very interesting role that, that every day will be different in. It's going to bring a huge amount of variety. Yeah, that And that's what I love about it. I suppose before I had been working in, this was Gaelic Games heavily between Fermanagh and Crow Park. And it was very much you were, as much as I loved and was passionate about Gaelic Games, it's not for everybody. So this I absolutely love because I'm working with, um, you know, from preschool uh, in terms of participation, preschool, right up to older adults, to disability, uh, to minority groups, ethnic minority groups, um, touching base with, with those kind of people, but also sports, a broad range of sports. Like I had a phone call the other day and I was laughing. I was like talking from 
to athletics, to uh, camogie. And then I was talking to bat and twirling, um, which is a sport and an entity. That is a sport. <laughs> yeah. And then canoe. And so like, you know, every day can be different. And, and I suppose it's not just the participation side, it's training and education and trying to increase um, coaches, referees and people who deliver sport locally that we can become sustainable in Cavan and, and, and trying to I suppose, have those physical um, physical activity and sports opportunities within the county. So it's exciting. Obviously, at the minute with lockdown, we're very much in virtual land and training and education. But please God, come the summer, um, we can really get that outdoor recreation up and running and um, there won't be too many, I'd say, you know, travelling too far. So it'll be a great opportunity to highlight Calvin as a base for tourism and not just to, you know, work in but to play and enjoy our county instead of having to go outside it very good tell me this you mentioned earlier how uh, both love and work brought you to to dublin but then he's, he's moved back to cavan you know what prompted that in in terms of you've, you've kind of already touched on in terms of your, your your family life but maybe the difficulties that you've encountered being in dublin while still having that drawback home to cavan yeah, I, I suppose we were working in Dublin and, you know, join, enjoying the Monday to Friday of it. But we were home every weekend, like we down the road Friday, back up Sunday. I was down the road maybe twice midweek. So, you know, I really probably I was working and living in Dublin, but technically I was at home. And, and that in itself was I found very difficult. And I could see both sides, like my early 20s playing sport at a high level. I was at home, you know, I was home at three or four, four o'clock from the school or five o'clock even. I had time to relax, get myself organised to go to training. Whereas when I was in Dublin, I was, you know, up the road um, or maybe on if we had an intercounty game, I was maybe down in Kerry or Waterford, getting back up to Dublin late that evening, get myself organised for work on the Monday, maybe a gym session or a rehab session, recovery session, back down the road Tuesday. So I literally had to prepare myself. Tuesday morning, I was gone from work you know, seven o'clock in the morning, I mightn't be back up in Dublin till 12 o'clock most times. And then I'm trying to get up and get to work again the next day. So like obviously at the time, you know, I loved my job and it was great, but I suppose in hindsight, that couldn't go on forever. And um, then when we actually decided we wanted to move home, I think it was, you know, we got to a stage in our lives where we were like, right, okay, I think it's time to, to try and make a shift home. And I suppose we were very lucky to, to buy a house at home. Um, which possibly may not have been an option living in Dublin. Um, so that was a great pull as well at home. But our family, like we're both from the same area, uh, Bombay. So that obviously um, made things a lot easier. So we were able to relocate home. Uh, but I still was working in Dublin. So I I ended up taking on a huge commute uh, from like Templeport to uh, Crow Park, so inner city Dublin. So it wasn't good at all. I ended up having to give up county because I just I just couldn't physically do it. I was gone seven in the morning and I was lucky to be home at eight o'clock at night, exhausted just from the driving that I was not going to be able to perform on a pitch. And you know, I found that really, really tough. And so I, I was commuting for maybe five months. And I suppose maybe, you know, given the pandemic now, I probably possibly would have had the opportunity to work at home and that would have been a lot easier. But the job opportunity and sports partnership came up. So in a way, coincidence, good timing, I don't know, but it um, was similar kind of work. So it was still sports development, uh, working with people in communities, which is what I wanted to do. And a great opportunity to be able to actually help the people of Cavan, um, which I, like, you know, it's fantastic. Like I love Gaelic games and I'm still able to maybe coach um, locally, you know, within my club and give back to my club. And, and that's a huge draw to being at home, that you have that work-life balance um, and that you're able to do more. You, you mentioned there about, you know, having to prepare your week, plan your week out, which was, you know, in a hectic schedule of both work and elite sport. But that's obviously a skill that's very transferable into employment then after that, that employers are going to be looking for. Definitely. And that, that's one thing I, I would um encourage all like young well I say young people I mean anything from school age up to graduates to if you're only a couple of years in your job that to draw from your experiences in sport um you know like time management communication uh teamwork like these are all like really uh values and 
really strong traits for an employer to look at so that they can see that, well, you know, Ashley's able to manage her time. Um, she's committed, like, you know, you've played at a high level of sport. You have to give that commitment outside your one or two hour training. You have to put in the extra effort behind the scenes. And that can be applied to work as well. But, you know, it's not just a nine to five that you're you're passionate about it and that you're able to, um, you know, make those critical decisions, uh, strategic thinking. Like they're all things that I've probably, you know, learned slightly from sport, but being able to develop that through college and through different experiences that I've been lucky to be involved in. Yeah, yeah, well, absolutely brilliant. We'll move on to uh, Jack Trainer, who's currently serving his apprentice with KBG, uh, apprenticeship in accountancy. Jack, firstly, I believe congratulations are in order. Did I hear correctly you've been offered a scholarship there? Or you've been awarded oh. a scholarship? Yeah, well, uh, it was the Monaghan Institute. That's where I spend one day a week in Monaghan now. And um, the application came out in the email. And for the year that was in it, it was previous years. I wouldn't have been able to go up and play with them during the week with the college. And this year it was on an application basis. I put in my application, best hopes of uh, being granted a scholarship. And I came back there just before Christmas and I was granted. So look, it was... A nice wee incentive to get for Christmas and just a nice reward, yeah. Excellent stuff. So uh, let's let's delve into you done the leave and search. I think it was in in twenty nineteen, and you you opted for the accountancy apprentice after filling out your CEO and everything, and then took it up in in July. Why did you go down the apprentice route um, and not college like like so many do? Well, I was set, it was until maybe March or April and I was had my mind set and going to college, I had a CEO filled out and it wasn't until one of the partners, Mark Riley, along with Jerry Smith, came into the school and I was a six-year student at the time, I was doing accountancy in school and I was a bit iffy about, is it accountancy I want to do in college or some general business degree? I wasn't sure if I wanted to delve into a degree fully into accountancy and basically the apprenticeship program arised. I saw it as an opportunity to see if I actually did like accountancy, if it was a career progression route that I wanted to take. Basically what happened, the process was that Mark came in, there was an application form to fill out. So I filled out my application form with the best hopes. I was talking with family and they said, look, go for it. I was only 17 at the time. So I was still very, like, I was still very young to be going to college at 17. Um, I saw the opportunity to stay at home. Also, there wasn't the extra expense of college as well. So basically, I saw this opportunity. I said, look, I enjoy accountancy as a subject in school. I was interested to see what it would be like to work in a workplace environment. So I handed in my application um, got offered the first interview, I think it was two weeks before my leaving cert. Then the second interview was just after my leaving cert, and which was the end of June. And then I started on the 1st of July. So it was a quick turnaround then. So, yeah. Very quick, very quick. Yeah. Tell me this. So, because it's the road less travelled, um, you're, you're in St. Pat's College, I was right in saying at the time yeah. in April. What, what was the reaction of the teachers to your decision to go down this route? Yeah, um, it wasn't until I left school really that they um, found out what route I took. And um, they've really, like, since I've left school, I've done talks with students, six year students in some parts about this route. It's really been, when I was in sixth year, there was no such thing as an accountancy apprenticeship until I heard about one. It was never a progression route that was considered. And even now, you see, I know a lot of people seem to be going down this practical learning route. Personally, I find myself that I work better by work, learning practically instead of reading out a book and college. And look, the college has to be done at the same time. But I thought the best way to learn is doing practically. And I found that a lot of people, even in similar situations, that were in sixth year last year, have gone on to do similar apprenticeships. And um, it's definitely a career progression route that probably wasn't explored enough when I was in school and maybe a few before me, but it's starting to really come to light now. 
Yeah, just from knowing, obviously, I'm involved with you with the, with the Cavan on the 20s, but Matthew McGahern is another player going down the apprentice route. He's in the insurance apprenticeship. Um, and I suppose one of the attractive things, you're coming out of, out of school life and instead of going to college and being broke, you're getting a nice little wage and learning on the job. So it, it, it's, it's a win-win. Yeah, definitely. It's nice to have a bit of cash. It's definitely a great incentive for a young age. Um, look, probably the main thing is um, it's a great financial strain off my family as well because what would have happened if I was going to college, I wouldn't have been able to fund myself through it now and I would don't pay any course fees for the Monaghan issue. It's completely covered by KBG. They pay for all college fees to Monaghan and to get me to this apprenticeship. And basically... I have no rental expenses to pay if I was living in accommodation in Dublin or no large college fees. So basically, it's a win-win for both myself and my family because I have a bit of money in my back pocket and there's probably a lot of stuff I've spent that I definitely don't need to be spending it on. But look, it's great to have a bit of cash there if needs be and it's a great way to save from a young age and it can set you up rightly, hopefully down the line. Yeah, without a doubt. So tell us this... What has working and studying locally meant in terms of your GA involvement? Obviously, you're, you're, you're working away with the Cavan on the 20s here. Yeah, look, um, it's a great opportunity, especially with the club, because when I first started out, um, there was a lot of midweek training sessions, and it's probably a huge problem within clubs around Cavan now, especially, that there's very low numbers around the club. So it's great to be there to add another number to training each week. It even made the difference to make even teams. like It's mad the difference one person can make to a training session with small numbers. So look, it's great to be around and it meant that I'm not commuting long hours. I can go that maybe hour if I have to before training and kick a bit of ball. I'm not expecting to travel back to Dublin or Galway or where I need to be. It was just handy to have a corn fan maybe only five minutes down the road. It's fine. It's about half an hour after, half an hour later there's no strain and I have to get back for this time or catch this bus. It was, it's a great strain of basically trying to um, meet deadlines when you can go down and enjoy football without any pressures. Yeah, without the travel time, I suppose it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's, yeah. a, it's a massive advantage. It, just going back briefly, um, in terms of the money, do you mind sharing with us what, what is the, the, the wage or what's the, the salary for uh, a first-year apprentice? Starting salary for first year apprentice is nineteen thousand seven hundred euro. So that's what I would have been on when I started out. So yeah, it was definitely a big jump from not earning a cent all through school to basically straight into the work of life. And look, it's a great wage for an apprentice, especially because um, not many people would be earning that sort of money. So look, it's a great boost. And does that? Like traditional apprentices, does that go up year in, year, like through your training? Yeah, well, um, well, I'm not sure. I'll have to, <laughs> <laughs> might have to talk to the partners about that. Um, <laughs> talk about words. But look, I think there is progression, really, if you want to get through. So obviously, you will start on base from um, when you start. And progressively, as you start to complete exams or finish your apprenticeship, you might start to go up until ultimately you become qualified. So there is definitely a pathway to um, increase, uh, yeah, increase, in, increase yeah. the wages. Very good, yeah. very good. So it's, it's always great to have a, a, a bit of a mm-hmm. carrot in front. So tell me this, how do you go about getting an apprentice in accountancy? Um, could you explain to some of the viewers? Well, basically, uh, the way it works is I will go to Monaghan Institute one day a week um, it, it is a two-year program. So what happens is I go to Monaghan each Monday and that course uh, is from nine to six in the evening. So it is a long day and you'll cover four topics. So my first year I covered, there was financial accounting, taxation, law and ethics and business management. So they are my four modules in first year last year. And for the remaining four days, you work with the firm. So I was working with KBG and... When I started with KBG, I was assigned a workplace mentor. So basically, what he done for me was he basically taught me the practical side of things. So when I first started, I barely knew how to, I barely knew how to use a printer at that stage. So look, it was 
the great help of somebody there to guide me through and he was able to help me this is what he needed done and he was able to help me step by step it was basically a teacher on uh, in the firm and even today I'm still learning a lot from him there's a lot left to learn and I'll always report to him if, if I have any problems he'll help me so that's the workplace mentor so basically you have your one day in month and your four days at work then you will sit exams in June so you have four exams in June uh, you will also have things, eight work-based assessments throughout the year. Uh, so that's basically the theory side of things. Then when you progress to second year, I think the exams are in June. So you start from September to June. And then from that period, I'm now in second year. Now I'm in my second year. I'm doing advanced financial accounting, advanced taxation, management accounting, and integrated accounting systems, which is your online software support using the accounting. So basically what I'm learning with each Monday in Monaghan is it, the course is structured that I'm able to then go into the workplace during that week and apply what I've learned on the Monday. So I could be learning a certain topic in tax, for example, that week. And the apprenticeship will con keep in contact with my employer and they'll say, uh, Jack here, he needs a bit of exposure in this area. Uh, try and make sure that he's getting a bit more exposure on a certain tax. These are more important taxes. This is what we want him trying. And certain things like this year, for example, um, last year I wouldn't have done any payroll at all. And this year, because it's now a new topic in my course, it's something that I've that the employer's now pushing for me to learn as well. So look, the two of them work very well together and keep a great communication with each other which ultimately benefits me. Yeah, without a doubt. Well, look, congratulations. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a great opportunity, and I suppose for yeah. anybody thinking of going down the same route, the Pathways Committee will be issuing more information on apprentice opportunities in CAV and um, at a later date. But congratulations, Jack. Um, a, 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 an opportunity that you're definitely grasping with both hands. Um, moving on now, I'm delighted to welcome Enda O'Reilly, who's the Assistant Principal at Cavan Institute. Enda, thanks a million for, for taking the time to talk to us. I suppose anybody familiar with Cavan knows the Institute building on the Cathedral Road there, but can you tell us a little bit about the Institute and the range of courses that it offers? I'm in the area of healthcare, uh, sport and physical therapies. Uh, we offer a broad range of courses in a range of different areas from beauty, computing, creative media, uh, hotel and catering, uh, accounting, business studies, uh, healthcare, uh, nursing, uh, sports, uh, tourism, veterinary, a whole, a whole range of areas. Uh, we have approximately, I suppose, maybe 100, 100 staff there at the moment, 70 full-time tutors, uh, a range of SNAs. We have uh, three career guidance uh, staff who are on hand to support a range of students. We have uh, a GP on site. Uh, we have, um, I suppose, sports teams, very, very kind of vibrant sports teams under the expert uh, tutelage of Brian Bates and uh, Shane McCabe. Uh, I suppose just in terms of the actual range of courses that we offer, uh, Broadly speaking, our, our courses would be certified by QQI Level 5. So a student coming in thinking to do a course with us, generally the main certifying body would be QQI. So uh, students have the option also then of staying for a second year and doing their QQI uh, Level 6. So I suppose over the recent number of years, what we've tended to do with our courses as well is to add on additional certification. So students may come in for one year, do your QQI level five, but they may have an opportunity then of doing, we'd say, for example, a music uh, production student could do a Pro Tools uh, external examination. So that's an industry uh, uh, recognised exam. Uh, also, our computing students, computer network students could do the Cisco examination. So that's in addition to the QQI level five. So really I suppose what we're doing is preparing students for progression and the workplace. Our sports therapy students will do the QQI level five, but they will also do iTech. So that's in addition to that, that be, could be iTech in terms of gym instruction, personal training, sports therapy, sports massage, 
our healthcare students, our nursing students will do the first aid, we'll do the patient movement and handling. So we're always kind of really conscious of that, that we are kind of doing that, given that both on qualifications that will give students really something uh, very, very tangible to kind of use when they either go into the workplace or into employment. We have a number of courses there as well where students can actually start off their degree program with us. So for example, a student in the area of science can come in and do the first year of a science degree and progress on to Sligo IT. So that's been a huge, you know, a huge plus. And it's something that we've kind of worked on recently as well. At Loan IT as well, again, another formal link there is a student can come in do the first year of the social care a degree program and then progress on to at loan IT afterwards. So that's the formal link. But I suppose with all our courses as well, we've so many informal links and progression is the main thing. You know, students start off with stay local. Uh, approximately 70% of our courses are geared towards progression. The other 30% are geared towards employment. But that's not to say, you know, a student coming in doing a course that's geared towards progression may end up going into employment because of the qualification and I suppose the additional qualifications that we put on the course as well. And I believe you offer in Cavan Institute um, a number of apprenticeships and traineeships in addition to the normal PLC courses. Yeah, I suppose, look, we work uh, very, very closely with the ETB, uh, Cavan Modern and ETB, and this is definitely an area that's going to expand over the next number of years. So in the area of traineeships, we offer a traineeship in youth work, healthcare and hospitality, and in the area of apprenticeships, we offer the Commie Chef apprenticeship. So we've done a considerable uh, refurbish to, to our building to facilitate that apprenticeship. And look, this is an area that will definitely grow and develop into the future, the whole area of traineeships and apprenticeships. And look, we, you know, we look forward to working closely with DTB on that. Can you give me an idea of like what the typical profile of, of a, a Cavan Institute student is? Yeah, I suppose, look, in terms of the further education sector, it, it has changed over the last four or five years. Traditionally, I suppose, the further education sector, you know, it was people coming back to education, mature learners and so on. But what we've seen over the last four or five years is that profile changing. Approximately 70% of our students are leaving cert students. So that's a huge change. Uh, students are now seeing this as a route or as a forced choice. The other 30% of students are mature students, students coming back to upskill and so on. But that leave and cert cohort uh, is definitely seen it has a route to uh, employment, further education, and also the opportunity to actually stay, stay local. About 60% of our students are from the Cavan area. We have students from all over the place. We have, we have students from Kerry, believe it or not who come up to do uh, various courses because they know people who, who, who have done similar courses. So I, I know just from chatting to those two Kerry students, they're up doing the occupational therapy students or up occupational therapy course. Uh, we would have a large number of students from Donegal, Galway and so on. All right. So uh, that's the kind of profile of our students. It's that leave and serve cohort. Um, and the students really thinking about getting a taste for a course area, not kind of jumping two feet forced into a degree program, going off, not sure what they want to do. So the really students now are kind of way more savvy in terms of, right, okay, let's let's get a taste. Let's see what this course is like, first of all, before we kind of jump into it. Uh, you know, so because we would so if you look at over the years, we would have seen students who have gone to ITs or universities and we would be meeting these students maybe 30 or 40 each year in October who have gone to ITs who have dropped out because it just wasn't for them and they're coming back to us we, we kind of link them up with the career guidance staff to come back to us settle into a course they get a taste for it they get the work placement side of it and then I suppose after the year or the two years with us they really kind of know what direction that they want to go in uh, so mm. That's the kind of typical profile as well. And I suppose, the, it, like, and you've touched on it there a wee bit, that, that kind of resonates way back when I was coming out of Leaving Cert, I opted to do a year in Cavan College as it was then. But the the, the difference being that it was, uh, as you say, a toe in the water. I, I found that coming from Leaving Cert where Mammy used to say, did you do your homework? Did you I, I, have your study done? Have you got your lunch packed? Then you did the Cavan College and it was, look, you're on, you're on your own now. You've got to take care of your own studies you've got to make sure you've got your to do your own work you've got to get your own lunch but it was it was a, a dip into independence rather than plunging straight into the cold water 
Yeah, look, at, and that's it. And that's, you know, we look at, I've met so many students over recent years, uh, students who, who come into us at the start of the year, never, not too sure what they want to do. Uh, also look at students who know what they want to do, they have the points, but yet they're deferring, taking that year out, just to be 100% certain that, that that is the area that they want to do. And I, again, that, that's a common enough team in recent years. It's not just for students with low points or don't have the points, it's students who have the points, but are just kind of been very, very cagey and, and very kind of, uh, you know, making the right decision. They're, 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 they're kind of saying, okay, let's go in, let's get a taste for this area. Let's do the one year, let's do the two years. Let's get that taste of work placement because the work placement element of all of our courses really kind of do steer the students in their in in that particular path. And look at even after some 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 students coming in, they may decide after a year, look at that this area is not for them, and and that could have a huge advantage for them in terms of actually starting in a IT or university and then dropping out after a year. So mm -hmm. what I always say to the students, you know, if you're coming in doing a course. You don't like it view it as a positive maybe that that's one area marked off it's not for you but look at you know the vast majority of students who come in get on a course you know they do progress on whether it's employment or progression and i suppose look at over the last couple of years or last couple of weeks we've been doing a number of video profiles or podcasts ourselves and we were just kind of linking in with former students and the first one of that was with uh, ronan patterson two weeks ago and ronan had a great story I remember meeting Ronan about two or three weeks ago or two or three years ago, along with Brian Bates and Shane McCabe. And Ronan really didn't know what he wanted to do. So we got chatting to him. Ronan ended up coming into us doing the sustainable energy course. He went on work placement. He progressed on to TUD. And he is actually now the main QS with the employer that he went on with work placement while he was in Cavan Institute. So Ronan had a really great story. And look at in terms of a whole range of other students, we, uh, for example, Patrick Riley was another student from British Law, came in and done the sustainable energy, progressed on to TUD uh, in construction management. Patrick is working now with Cumnor. Um, Daniela Colwell, again, another student uh, from Galway. I met her father. Her father was a lecturer in GIMIT. Father brought her up because he had known someone else who had done the sports therapy course. So Daniela, uh, who was plays with Mayo, came up and done two years uh, sports therapy course, progressed on to Salford uh, University of Manchester. She is now doing physiotherapy studies. Um, mm. Another example, Michael Flood. We have really, really good story with Michael. Michael was from Ballinacree. I met Michael about four or five years ago. Again, Michael wasn't too sure what he wanted to do. Uh, came in and done the sports coaching and sports development course and we just we had a great chat with Michael in terms of his pathway and career pathway that was last night Michael actually progressed on to UCC directly from uh, Calvin Institute to do PE teaching and he's actually started working uh, in Temple Michael as a PE teacher in September Jack touched on, on the cost element of going away to college you know what sort of fees are there if, if somebody is staying around in Calvin? Yeah, yeah. Look, if someone's coming, typically we would have a registration fee of two hundred and fifty euros. So that's the typical. Okay. That's that's across the board. There's also a PLC fee, but if you're on a medical card or back to education or on a grant, you're exempt from that. And there's also then a QQI uh, fee of I think it's fifty euros. So the fees are we, we we keep the fees as low as we possibly can. On some of the courses, there will be course fees. Okay. But as I said, you know, with all our courses, we try and keep the fees down. So typically, you know, a pro you know, we're looking at the region of 500 to 550 euros. And as I said, some of that fee, they may be exempt. But again, just in terms of detailed information on our course fees, if you just log on to our website, www.calvininstitute.ie, because as I said, some courses, particularly maybe in the area of beauty and so on, uh, you may have to buy your beauty kits and so on. So just be careful on that. And before we finish up, I know that the play, uh, that the Pathways community are very supportive of the Future Stars Initiative at Cavan Institute. Can you tell us a bit more about it? Yeah, look, this is something we started about five years ago. We kind of work closely with the uh, post-primary schools in the region and outside of the region. So we, we uh, select uh, 15 uh, future stars, male and, and female. So this has been going really, really well for us for the last few years. Uh, we bring the students in on the day. We have a seven-a-side competition. But obviously, look, that didn't run this year. But look, at where we under Brian Bates and Shane McCabe now, we've come up with a new idea. We're running a virtual future uh, all-stars. 
So we've asked all the schools in the region and outside to submit a panel of 20 players and to select three or four future stars on that panel. So we have approximately 600 students. All the students will be getting a goodie bag over the next few weeks. And the students that the schools have selected, we are going to try, if we can, to pick out uh, 15 future uh, stars, male and female. And uh, the way we're going to do it, it's 50% voting online and 50% selection by a Cavan Institute panel based on the information supplied by the schools. Uh, so that'll be kicking off next week. And we're delighted that uh, Raymond Galligan and Roisin O'Reilly have done a short video for us uh, to kick it off. So you can go online, vote for your vote for your player. We're just conscious as well, Damien, that we're not making that vote uh, known to the public because we just want to safeguard those younger people as well. Mm. So uh, on the night of the 25th of March, we'll be announcing the 15 male and 15 female All-Stars. Each of those will get a personalised Cavan Institute uh, jersey. And if they come to us within the next two years, they will be exempt from the student registration fee. So look, it's, it's just something mm. that uh, we want to try and give back to the secondary schools particularly the students in the final year, because we know it's been a tough, it's been a tough year for them as well. So. Well, it's a credit to you to continue to persist with, with the idea of the future stars in, in, in a very, very difficult situation with, with, with COVID and that. So I have to commend you all for that in Cavan Institute. Just before we wrap up, um, Ashley, if I don't mind going back to you and I'll ask all three the same question, I suppose, what, uh, what advice would you give to the leaders of students facing their exams and the predictive grades this year? Um, it's a good question. Um, I was casting back at the time, you know, when you're in that situation, it is it is a big deal and, you know, it's everything. You can't really see past that. But something that's always stuck with me is, is control the controllable. So, you know, apply yourself uh, to your work. You can only do the best that you can do given the situation. We are in a pandemic. So go easy on yourself, but also use use your local networks. Um, like I think it's fantastic to listen to both Enda and Jack there. Like I've learned so much and be able to tr hopefully advise some of the girls around me um, and, and young people around me. But also there's a huge network and that's what Gaelic is great for. At club level and inter-county level, there's different pathways, there's different industries and there's different ways of getting into um, education streams. So, Talk to your senior club players or your older girls, maybe that are in or boys that are in college, and get a bit more information. Um, I suppose that, that is, and use your use your networks locally or at county level. Try and um, try and get into those pathways. Yeah, phenomenal advice, Jack. You're you're the youngest of us all. Sorry for for revealing. I'll not give the exact ages, but you know you you probably have the recency bias there. What what advice would you give to somebody that's that's just uh, looking ahead to their leaving cert exams or or the predictive grades, whichever option they go for? Yeah, look, it's strange times. Obviously, there's not long left to go now. It's basically put your head down, get what you can get done. Basically, in that time, it's only you only get out of what you put in and also just don't be closing yourself off like I know times now people there's times we're in people need to be start communicating with one another don't be closing yourself in a book either get out chat to friends if it means get out to the pitch and kick a ball for an hour if you can just get that space of mind and it'll actually benefit you with your studies as well Mm, incredibly mature answer there, Jack. It's it's almost scripted. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I tell you what, if you can top that answer and uh, offer for <laughs> advice, you'll be doing well. So you will. What what would you say though? Obviously, you deal with leaving starts coming in. Yeah. Um, what advice yeah, look, would you we, offer them? Yeah, there's so so much pressure, I suppose, on the leaving cert, and, and particularly this year. You know, so it, it's just to say to students, look, there are other options out there. You know, fair enough, we're encouraging students to do well on the leaving cert, but look, there are other routes. You know, and Jack has just spoken about there. You know, um, so look at, and I suppose in everybody's career path, there are so many twists and turns. You know, and look at, I always learn from a negative. You know, so where you don't succeed in one area, view it as a positive and move on. You know, so look mm. at, and I suppose the one thing that's coming out of the employment uh, pathways is the wealth of knowledge and experience that's in our senior senior level players, whether it's the ladies, the lads, or Camogie. All of these lads and ladies have progressed on. So when you have a cohort of younger people there, don't be afraid to chat to these people and talk to them about their career pathways and what way they went about it and so on. So I, I suppose that's something that the pathways committee would probably will be working on in terms of 
peer mentoring and um, you know and, and just getting those younger players to link up with their uh, senior senior cohorts. Okay, so that brings us to the end of this week's program. We thank you again to Ashley Doonan from Cavan Sports Partnership, Jack Trainer, uh, apprentice accountant with KBG Accountants, and Enda O'Reilly from Cavan Institute. This was orig- originally intended to be the final broadcast in the series, but we have one bonus episode next week where we will be speaking to a number of employers about the job opportunities they have on offer in the county. Don't forget, all the episodes are still available on the YouTube channel. So on behalf of Cavan GA and the Player Pathways Committee, thank you for tuning in and we hope you will join us again next week.